All right, good, whatever, afternoon, morning, whenever you're watching this. My name is Bob Rombach. I am the founder of the We Are Network. That's Dan Heinrich again. It's the Bob and Dan Show. You know the routine. We're excited to talk again. Lots of stuff shaking uh, right now in in our worlds. Of course, we're going to still talk a little bit of geocaching. We are enjoying doing that, and we're enjoying the feedback y'all are giving us. Um, got the NFL draft tonight, and we're going to maybe touch on Major League Baseball today. So we're going to kind of broaden it up a little bit, but you're going to see where our real sweet spot is probably a little bit later. But let's talk about uh, geocaching. Well, actually, first, how are you doing today, Dan? I'm doing great today, Bob. And yeah, kind of fun to think about some other stuff besides the geocaching with the draft yeah. coming up tonight and some a little bit of chit chat about baseball and some other sports that maybe yeah. start to get loosened up here over the next couple of months here. Yeah, certainly hopeful to see some of those stories popping out now. But yeah, Having that NFL draft out there, and yeah, that yeah, that's been one thing that's just been consistently staying on track for the schedule, and people have been looking forward to it, and should be quite the spectacle tonight. Well, it's like the first real sporting event since the day that NBA shut her down, and uh, yep. I think people have been looking forward to this a lot. So, all oh, right, yeah. well, good. I, I'm a excited lot to look forward to. Now, in the past, you kind of didn't pay too much attention to the off season. As I mean, that was a while ago. But do you pay more attention now? I really haven't or, paid too much attention. But the, there's kind of a quirky—I th- wouldn't say quirky thing, but something that's a little more interesting to me than normal is that there's a player from St. John's that's probably going to oh, go yeah. fairly high in the draft. And I went to college at St. John's and. I always keep tabs on their football team, and there's this one player, Ben Barch, is this player's name, and he went to college, was a tight end, and he transitioned to be an offensive lineman. I've read the stories about how he packed on some weight, and he's projected to go either like late second, early third round, so he's going to get picked. It's just a matter of when, and I can't remember the last time St. John's actually had a player get drafted. I know... Years ago, probably early 2000s, there was this player named Blake Elliott, and he was yeah. a super duper star. And yeah. he didn't get drafted. He ended up being a undrafted free agent. The Vikings tried him out for a while. I think he got hurt during training camp, and that was mm-hmm. kind of the end of his NFL run. But as far as actually getting drafted, I mean, for any Division three player to get drafted is fairly yeah. rare. Yeah. And for them to be drafted in the third round is even rarer. I can only think of a player or two from Division Three that, I guess, well, Pierre Garçon. I mean, yeah. probably everyone who's played fantasy football has picked him <laughs> up off the waiver wire at some point. But, yeah, he was a D3 guy. I think Cecil, Cecil Shorts was Division Three as oh, yeah. well. So, but, yeah, a couple of those guys. I mean, it happens. D3 guys make it. So, it's, it's really cool to see a St. John's kid getting quite a bit of buzz on the draft boards. That's that is fun. I'll keep an eye. What's his name again? Ben Barch. Ben Barch. That's cool. Any chance he goes to the Vikings? Stays in state. They're looking at him. Are they? And it's wow. It's the consistent Viking thing, right? They're always looking at offensive line help and yeah. hey, get a good St. John's guy on there, and and who knows? I mean, you're, right. this law of average is eventually they're going to hit on something, right? That's right. Uh, So Danny is a Packer fan. I am a Viking fan. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on and kind of see where Dan thinks the Packers, what they'll end up doing. uh, And I'll kind of give you my ideas for the Vikings. But yeah, I haven't paid super close attention to that. But there's a lot of interesting things. The Gophers have a lot of guys who are starting to or who have made a lot of noise and they you know i'm interested to see where the gophers guys go uh the badgers it'd be it's gonna be fun to see where all those guys land too so we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more later but let's talk a little geocaching this is our fourth episode first three were dedicated primarily to geocaching and the re- you know people have been really interested and i see a big uptick on geocachers just as a review geocaching is basically like a treasure hunt where you get it's kind of like a high-tech treasure hunt i think is how they describe it they uh somebody goes out into the woods or on a guardrail like they're everywhere and they hide something that could be that small to big you know jars of things uh, ammo boxes and, and everything in between 
And uh, you can uh, plug the coordinates basically into your GPS. And there's an app for that that you don't have to really mess with any of that. It'll point you right to it, drive you right to it, and, uh, well, close to it. And then you've got to get out and, and look for it. Sometimes you can go on a trail, which, which we're going to talk about today, uh, and just make a day of it and go find a bunch of geocaches or um you know, maybe grab one or two on the way home from work and keep a streak alive. Um, so you go, you find it, you sign the log book that's inside of it. And sometimes it's uh, really small. So bring your own pen or pencil uh, and then put the thing back where you found it and uh, let it, you know, for the next person to enjoy. And uh, that's basically geocaching uh, in a nutshell. Uh, you can download the geocaching app, go to geocaching.com, make sure you sign up there. It's uh, it's free. There is a premium membership, which both Dan and I are uh, premium members. And it's, uh, you know, do start out basic, go find a few geocaches. And if you like it, then uh, it, I think it's worth the, I think, what is it, Dan? 10 bucks for three months or something like that? Yeah, I think it was 10 bucks for three months. And then if you wanted to go for the whole year, it was 30. So a bit of a yeah. price break if you sign up for the, the full year. But yeah, if you just want to dabble into the the premium membership you certainly try it out for yep. $10 for those three months. And if you like yeah. it, you can extend it on. Yeah, it's been fun. We've been getting more and more friend requests on geocaching.com and then we can be, you know, kind of, kind of compete. It's not really a competitive thing, but it's fun. You know, like we'll take a look at the uh, midway leaderboard here at some point during the, the show and see where Danny and I are and uh, in relation to all of the, the friends. Um, Okay, so let's. I kind of alluded to it, Dan. You let's talk about trails. So uh, geocaches can be placed anywhere the cache hider will contact the, you know, whether it's the DNR or a personal. Like th they contact people, they hide it, and then then we can go on it. And one of the things that is big in our area is trails, right? Yeah. So. These trails out there and the Gandhi Dancer is a trail that we've spoken about a few times on mm -hmm. this show. I mean, it's a trail that has hundreds of geocaches that have been hidden on it. And geocaching has their rules that a cache can't be within a tenth of a mile from another cache. So you'll see on these trails like the Gandhi Dancer and some others, if they've been pretty well mined with geocaches, you will see on this map just a steady string of green dots to indicate there's a lot of geocaches out there. And you can do these trails. Some people call them power trails when there's a lot of geocaches kind of condensed into a, into a um, set of a few miles. But you can do them a lot of different ways. Like sometimes if I'm out there with the bike, I'll go get every other one on the way out and then I've got a few to get on the way back. Or if you want to get, say, every fourth one because they're just so close to each other and you don't want to spend all the time getting on and off your bike, yeah. you can do it that way. And then you just know, like, oh, okay, I'm going to come back and get the other ones that I didn't get in one day because the Gandhi Dancer and some of these other power trails, they're, they're so long and there's so many, there's no way you're going to be able to get <laughs> the whole thing in one day. Right. Yeah. And I'm my computer's giving me some fits here. What is going on here? I'm going to show you guys a, um, I'm going to show you guys the map of it. If I can ever get it to cooperate here. So, yeah, and, uh, can, and you can see just pulling, how close they are. Sure. And as, as you're pulling it up, I can speak a little bit more about the Gandhi dancer because we were looking at this in our prep for the show is that uh -huh. I think it starts down in St. Croix falls and it goes up through Danbury, through that one that you got the last show where your kids yeah. were calling on the bridge and you make that <laughs> jump over into Minnesota. And then there's a lot more once you go across into Minnesota and probably about a hundred or some more as you continue further up. There's a little spur that goes to the west off that trail so you can get another big long set of them over there. I don't think the trail goes all the way up to Duluth, but it's I don't know how many miles it goes from Southern Point to Northern Point, but it's got to be yeah. close to a hundred. And yeah. with that trail, if every tenth of a mile has got a geocache, you can do the math, and you're going to get hundreds of geocaches out there to find. 
Right. And you're, I mean, you're, okay, so you can see my haphazardly loaded screen here. I don't know why uh, this is happening, but you can see I'm just kind of dragging the, the mouse down part of the trail from basically Clam Falls, not, you know, I don't know what that is, about six, eight miles south of Siren, and just kind of going down to Balsam Lake. And there's just hundreds of them. And, and if I was, if I, if this wasn't messing up, we could see kind of the whole thing. Let's see. I don't think that's going to help. Well, here's some more all the way down near St. Croix Falls. So, yeah, didn't your dad and mom, uh, they just had a massive uh, geocaching day. And uh, I think it wasn't, was part of that on the Gandy Dancer or was that, am I wrong? Yeah, I think, I think most of it was on the Gandy Dancer. And I think they ended up starting in Lewis and okay. going a little bit north. I don't know if they made it all the way to Siren or not, but they just took that huh. small segment of the Gandy Dancer, and I think they got close to 40 that one day last week where they yeah. posted that huge number on the leaderboard. And, <laughs> and that, yeah, big day, 40 geocaches, and it barely put a dent into the number that's out there over the right. full Gandy Dancer. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, there, there's probably... 800 of them out there it'd be interesting just to yeah. to see it did ned low hide all 800 of them or <laughs> did someone else help him out and yeah that's that's just one of the many power trails kind of around the area yeah i know down in st croix too there is the ice age trail which i that i'm i'm sort of confused by it's not like traditional geocaches it's called there's a lot of what's called um, cold caching. You can actually go to the Ice Age Trail website and look up cold caching. I have to do a little bit more research. It's like brand new to me, but I think it's like, uh, it's almost like earth caches where you uh, are directed to a place and then you take a picture of it and then you can log in, something like that. So that's a, okay. that's a neat thing. And the Ice Age Trail is really cool. Um, so, and then you've got the one, What what's the name of it again? By 35? Yeah, I think it's the yeah, I think it's the Sunrise Trail over just on the east side of Interstate 35. I think it starts okay. around North Branch. Maybe it goes up a little bit north of there. But then it goes pretty much parallel to 35 when you go down through through Harris and mm. but maybe not, not even to Harris. I'm sorry. You go down through Stacy and Wyoming, Forest Lake. And, and there's, there's a pretty good segment of geocaches that are on that trail. It's a really flat trail. So it it's uh -huh. nice to walk. It's nice to ride bike on that trail. And, and yeah, there's quite a few geocaches on that trail as well. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think one of our strategies, maybe even this weekend, cause it's supposed to be gorgeous finally is, uh, and I guess we don't even have to wait for a weekend generally now with this situation, but I think we're going to park, we're, uh, we're going to take two cars. We're going to park one at one end of the trail maybe, you know, figure out how, how long of a day we want park and then everybody drive up in one car. We'll walk down to the other car and drive. Everybody. I think that's a good strategy, isn't it? If we were going to knock, knock some out, that's a, that'd be a fun way to do it. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a great strategy. I know I mentioned before about the getting every other, I, I made the rookie mistake not that long ago of, okay, you, you park at one point of the trail and you just keep on going. And then it's like, Oh, I'm kind of done. And I'm six miles away from my car. Oh boy, <laughs> it's gonna be a long yeah. hike back. So yeah, exactly. So yeah, you gotta be. Yeah, I think kind of be planful on how to set your route up. I probably shouldn't have broadcast what I was planning on doing. I've got to got to keep that lead. But we'll see if I even <laughs> have a lead. <laughs> but okay, cool. So let's kind of transition. That's great. Uh, Power trails, Gandy Dance, and the We Are Network area is probably one that every single one of us is familiar with. And uh, you know, when we pass you on the Gandy Dancer, we'll uh, wave, and uh, um, that'll be that would be kind of fun to kind of see some people out there this weekend on the Gandy. Um, okay, so let's transition into you had a, a somewhat unique deal this. Uh, one of your last finds where you were, you had to write a note to the, the cash uh, owner. Can you kind yeah. of walk us through what, what happened there? Yeah, absolutely. So I see that you've got the list of geocaches up on your screen right now. And there's the mm -hmm. one that's got that little line through it. It was named Kaboom. And you see there's a 
red wrench over in the info. There's there's a number over to the left of that. I can't see what the number is, but that's the 18. number of 18. Okay, so that's the number of favorite mm -hmm. points that have been given out. So people that enjoy a specific geocache can give it a favorite point and it can attract other traffic to that geocache if people want mm -hmm. to find some kind of clever containers or whatever makes a geocache a favorite. So, so if you can click into that log entry and spoiler alert, I also gave this one a favorite because <laughs> I kind of have a standing, I have a standing rule that if anything has to do with baseball, I give the, the cache a favorite. <laughs> so, so this geocache container was really clever. It was an old softball that the, oh. the cache owner had like, hollowed out the interior portion of it and turned it into a geocache. Pretty awesome. Oh man. But the problem was the cap that covers up the the hollowed out part was missing. So oh. there wasn't any there was no log in the inside of it. It was kind of a little bit wet in the inside. So it's like, well, it's a bummer that that was missing. So I wanted to just make the cache owner aware that there was an issue with the geocache and other people had alluded to that on previous logs as well, saying that the top was missing and mm -hmm. yeah, there wasn't a log in the inside or maybe there had been, but it was soaked. By the time I got to it, there was just yeah. nothing on the inside of it. So one thing that you can do is you can write a note on your log entry. So there's that big button when you go and see a geocache. And I think if you scroll upwards, Bob, you'll probably see the, the log your visit button at the top of the screen. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if you click log the log geo, yeah, if you click that, mm -hmm. there's going to be a few different options that you can pick from, and one of them will be write note. So if you write a note, I believe that's going to give a couple of other options as well, or maybe maybe since it's disabled, that you also write those options. So oh. when I was making my note on here it gave you some pre-filled things to say, what are you writing about? And one Let thing- Let me see you can if I can find that, a, a, an active one. Sure. But one thing you can say is that it needs some maintenance. So you, you just click the mm. needs maintenance. It may have even been just a checkbox that you could check to say that it needs maintenance when you write the note. And then it automatically posts a log entry that says, oh, click on that report a plot problem. That was it. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Yep. Well, there we go. Yeah. Log, so you see those full, containers there. damaged, cash be missing. Yeah. Exactly. Cash I think you can archived. Do, I think you can do that even from the found it type of log. Oh, really? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be a note. Mm -hmm. I think you can still report a problem. So, so you could consolidate uh, two entries into more, one. Yeah, it's a little more limited as far as your choices. So. Okay. Okay, okay but but yeah, I did run did write that note, say that the cache was damaged and it posted an entry on the geocache page that said that a geocacher had reported that the, the container was damaged. And the cache owner saw that note and he went out and deactivated the cache. So you, that's what causes that line to show up. So the owner temporarily disabled the listing because he knows that I'm going to go out and check this at some point, but that point's not going to be right now. So he just took it offline momentarily. When he goes back out there, he'll probably see the cache. So, you know, I guess I need to put a new container on the top of this thing. And then he can go and reactivate it. Now there's times where, let's say there's been three or four logs of a cache hasn't been found, a DNF entry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the owner may go out there and say, yep, it's gone. And this is where they can archive the geocache and then it just wouldn't show up on anyone's search results pages anymore. And I, if you'd mm -hmm. already found it, if you'd already found it in the past, you would mm -hmm. still have credit for the find. It doesn't go away. It's just mm -hmm. that no one knew would be able to find it. Right. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think that's and, and it's important to do this kind of stuff. It's part of being a good community member when there's something like that that happens you know, to help out, help out the cash owner, because how else would they know unless somebody tells them? So good job. Right. You're a good uh, member of our uh, 
geocaching society. <laughs> well, thanks, Bob. I know I'm this person who had, <laughs> I know that means a lot this, to you. <laughs> <laughs> this person who put this out, I think he's set like 500 or so geocaches out there. So, uh, and okay. like if Medlo were to get one of these, I know he's set hundreds of geocaches out there as well. So it gives him that heads up as far as I don't need to go and do maintenance on all 500 geocaches I found. I'm going to do the ones that have been specifically tagged as needing maintenance. So it helps the owner out quite a bit to, yeah. to figure out which ones to go do maintenance on. Cool. Um, one thing I've noticed, and this doesn't have anything to do with the note writing really, but I see there's two different dates here. So if we look at your, um, here is your, you know, found it, uh, logbook entry. Here's your note. Both of these are um, dated 417. And then the needs maintenance was dated 418. Uh, what's the, what happened there? Yeah. So what happened there was I actually made the find on the 17th, but I didn't write the logs until the 18th. And it's an option when you're logging a geocache to select a date from the calendar to say what date you actually found it. Now, I did that through the website. I haven't found a way on the app to be able to set the date for a find. I've only been able to say, okay, mm. I've, it's the 18th today, so I have to put down the 18th if I'm using the app. But through the website, mm -hmm. there's the, I think it's on the upper right of the text box. You can just click that date. And if you click on it, then a calendar is going to drop down and you'll be able to pick a certain okay. date that you actually made the find. So that, and that can, can be really helpful. Cool. Okay. I'm going to pull one up. Hopefully this works pretty fast. Uh, oh, I thought I picked welcome to Cushing, but I guess not. Hold on. This one's called Athos. Uh, I'll go to log geocache. I'm not going to actually log it because we're going to go find it at a point. And this is what he's talking about. So found it, uh, share your story. Don't leave spoilers. Um, and then here, so you can predate it. Obviously, you can't post date it because that would be cheating. But yeah, you can predate it. Um, I've seen lots of people do that. They'll come up, you know, maybe geocaching at the cabin, and then they'll go home and you know log, you know, twenty of them mm -hmm. that they found over the weekend or something. Um, so yeah, I've I've definitely seen that. That's a nice handy thing to be able to do. And I think there have been people, from what I can tell. I will be out and, um, and you know, signing logs and, and these kinds of things. And uh, I see people on there uh, have found it, but they're not in the geocaching, like the app. They haven't yep. logged it in here, but they've logged it on site. So I'm just thinking, like, I know we have a lot of new people doing this in the area. So uh, if that's you, log it in when you find it. That's awesome. And then... Make sure you plug it in the in the electronic, you know, electronically on geocaching.com through your app or when you get home, you can type them all up. But uh, that's just that's helpful and it's fun for the the game to kind of go back. I we love looking at old logs, like the last five or six. Almost any time we go out, I mean, it's whether we need a, a an, another hint that we can maybe try to figure out from the logs or just. Oh, these guys are out. These guys found it. Oh, Danny was here. And what happened And at his 1200th yeah, it, find? <laughs> well, it, and it's just nice to know that people have actually been finding it too. So if you've been yeah, out there yes, that's right. looking for a geocache, you've been spending 10 or 15 minutes hunting for something. And you look at the logs and like, well, no one's found this for a year and a half. And it, there might be an issue. Mm -hmm. Or right. if someone or if people have been finding it recently, you know, like, okay, it's out here somewhere. I'm going to stay mm -hmm. after it. Yep, that's that's exactly right. We we yesterday Renee and I went out. My wife and I went out, and our first three caches were DNFs. We've never had three oh, in no. a day, much less three in a row. We were really starting to doubt ourselves. Um, but we looked in, in two of the logs; they haven't been found since 2017. So we're like, well, sure. maybe maybe they're gone. But the other one, what's the day today? It would have been the 22nd yesterday, had been found 10 days prior. And okay. uh, we're like, okay, so it could be gone. It could it could have washed away or an animal taken it. Um, but I started thinking, do people think that this is to go find these treasures and bring them home? I mean, that came through my mind. 
So if you find it, just put it back almost, you know, exactly where you found it. So mm -hmm. my little, I'm sure they did. I think, I, you know, you just kind of go through the possibilities. So yeah. I don't want to be, <laughs> I want to make people know all the steps to proper geocaching. So, cause yeah. I'm and still kind of angry stuff about happens. it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I know some of these, some of these magnetic ones I'll see, it's like, if you don't get the magnet to stick on like the inside of a yeah. fence post and it'll fall down. It's like, uh Oh, <laughs> this yep. thing is gone. Yeah, no, you, that's right. Uh, uh, Nedlow likes guardrails. So you'll park on the side, like over a, over a culvert or over a stream or river. So he'll get, he has a lot of magnetic ones and sometimes they're really, really small. They have the little magnet inside. So we went to one the other day. I found it. Uh, Renee didn't just for the record, I found it, pull it off, sign the log, tried to put it back in clunk, clunk, like it's not sticking. So the magnet had actually stayed on the guardrail and I had like oh, pulled okay. the pull, uh, in my, uh, excitement. I just grabbed it too hard. And the, so, so that's another thing that can happen. So just try to maintain it as best you can. I was able to get back together, but, um, yeah, lots of stuff can happen. So that's why it's important to fill out those DNFs. Uh, that did not find and, and send messages to the cash owners. I know they appreciate it. So very good. Well, let's see. I think that kind of ticks the things off that we were going to talk about as far as geocaching, isn't it? Or was there anything, was there, am I missing something? No, I, I think that was it. We covered some of those power trails out there, like the sunrise mm -hmm. trail and the Gandy dancer and the mm -hmm. ice age trail. And, and yeah, we can talk about more in, in the future as the, radius expands if you want to maybe maybe take on yeah. in central minnesota or central wisconsin i mean there's there's trails all over the place you can have some fun yeah, zooming, right. out, zooming out on that map and and just see what you got <laughs> yeah for sure there's so many the, this will only show like i think 500 around your uh wherever your point is well let's do this then um let's do a midweek check on the leaderboard let me put this up so you're not looking at the back of my head that's always fun I'll, we'll put dan in the lower right hand corner since he's ageless <laughs> all right let's look at the uh where am i leaderboard so we have about three days left in the week in the geo week three days 14 hours okay so this is we're going off of my uh geocaching.com account so if you're now friends i with, know why you're this excited is, to see this <laughs> don't make me mute you okay i have that power <laughs> so last week now look there's so much time left this is nothing but yeah i am totally smoking you uh but last week <laughs> uh i had oh, i'm almost to my total last week last week your mom and dad s smoked everybody nedlow 363 i ended up with the bronze beat you by 22 uh, hopefully beat you by more this time uh this week I do have the lead, but it's not an insurmountable lead and a, not an insurmountable number. Here's, what is this? One, two, three. That's on the strength of nine caches, okay. basically in seven of them in one day. I mean, that's, that's, that's going to be easy for you. So, and you've got 24 in just two fines. So yep. at least, I mean, it, it, it doesn't take long to get up there. So, uh, so again, the steps you need to take are uh, to get a geocaching.com account and then friend us. And by the way, we'll we'll put that up in the description, uh, how to friend Danny and myself. And we'll also put in the description a geocaching cheat sheet uh, that has been pretty popular. I think people are really liking the geocaching cheat sheet. You just, uh, we'll email it right to you. You just got to give us your email address. We'll get it out to you. So, um, yeah. So, uh, 115 points, not uh, not bad, but not uh, that's not going to win the week. So, uh, make sure you you follow us and, and and get in on the competition. All right. So we can put that to bed. Uh, who who? What do the Packers need tonight? Tonight's the start of the draft. So we're recording this on Thursday. You'll see yep. it on Friday. What what do you see going into round one? What do you want? Yeah, because you got round one. So I was thinking about this, like how many teams are the proverbial one piece away? So the Packers, the Vikings, they're both 
playoff teams last year. They both got smoked by the same team in the playoffs. So <laughs> you can make an argument that the Packers and the Vikings were pretty identical last year. Like probably about I would, sixth or seventh best teams in the league. So mm-hmm. what what is that piece? Well, obviously, keeping Aaron Rodgers upright is of critical importance. You figure you've got the running back is pretty well set. Aaron Jones, I know. Eli keeps talking about how Aaron Jones might be the best Aaron on the team, but I kind of like having those two guys. I, I say more defense. I just keep beefing that up. I'm excited to see what the Packers are going to do this year defensively. Just you've had a full year in the system now and things are coming around last year and you're not just a team that has to score 40 points to have a chance to win. I mean, I don't know how many times Rogers has lost games and he's put up five touchdowns. So <laughs> So it's nice that he can score 13 points and win instead of 38 and lose. So I think the pack will probably go to the defensive side of the ball unless they've got just some scream and deal available to them at the end of the right. first round. How about your guys, Bob? Well, first of all, I think you're probably right. I don't like, as a Vikings fan, what's happening on your defense because that used to be so terrible. But those <laughs> Smith boys, holy cow. And especially the, the second time you guys played us, was it Zadarius Smith? Yeah, just owned us, every single one of the the Vikings. It was nuts. So, oh, that was uh, great. That was probably the best <laughs> defensive game I've ever seen the Packers play. It was just – it was amazing. And you could tell just right from the get-go, I think, what the Packers fumble right off the bat and the Vikings got yeah. the ball down like that 10-yard line and went nowhere. It's like, oh, this yeah. is good. And I think the Packers <laughs> turned it over again, and then the Vikings didn't even score. And after that, yeah. I don't think they saw the other side of the field. And that was just – it's a lot. Of, we got used to watching offensive football as Packers fans. It's kind of neat to see a defense field that just shut down a quality offense in the Vikes. That's so funny. It's totally opposite for me. <laughs> the <laughs> defense has been so good for so long. To, in my mind, just – the eye test took a step back last year. Uh, offense, I hope, can get it together. I I really think the Vikings need to start at offensive line. Uh, I could be convinced that uh, defensive line, interior defensive line, is an important uh, place for them to draft. Uh, and on the edges on defense, the cornerbacks. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised to see an uh, offensive lineman uh, – or a corner safety type player or an interior defensive lineman. That's where I'm thinking the Vikings will go. However, there's also a shot that they'll take the right wide receiver in the first round. So that's my first round predictions. (laughs) I kind of hedge my bet. That's four big positions, but uh, O-line, D-line, cornerbacks, and wide receiver. (laughs) It's not going to be a quarterback. Well, it might be a quarterback if somebody totally drops down. Yeah, not a kicker. So – uh, yeah, that's uh, that's but that's my order of uh, wants. I would love to see the Vikings draft Antoine Winfield Jr., Minnesota boy. His dad played for the Vikings. Heck of a player, really good player, uh, and probably a position of need. Uh, he's a safety, I think he's listed as, but he's he could maybe play cornerback. I think that would be. I, I would be really happy if they did that. I'm not, you know, I think our front office is as good as anybody in the, in the league, or whatever they do, I'll be, I'll be excited about, but, um, and not to mention we have half the picks in the draft. So that's kind of right. nice too. So, <laughs> so the interesting thing about the draft is that it's all remote, just like everything else is these days. Yeah, so just like if this. You had to pick, yeah. If you had to pick one team, Bob, that would miss their pick because their video conference crashed or they forgot, <laughs> They forgot to like set their auto draft order. Who would that be? <laughs> well, if past is prologue, then the Vikings are definitely a uh, <laughs> candidate to that. Uh, let's see. I mean, the Bengals are always fumbling, screwing stuff up. The Browns are always screwing stuff up. I, I think it'd be ironic if it was like San Francisco, right in you know Silicon Valley or whatever nearby sure. there, that they'd have tech problems. Um, that's who I would, off the top of my head, that's a really funny question. Uh, 
that you're, that's yeah, funny that you went to the the Browns and Bengals the first two because that's the exact <laughs> first two I've got. It's like I could see really? the Bengals like <laughs> forgetting to hit submit on the number one pick in the draft. It's like, did oh, they I guess- do that in a? They did that in a trade or something last year, didn't they? They forgot to like yeah, submit yeah. it to the league or something. Yeah, because it was right up against the trade deadline. And it's like, yeah. oh, it's 401. You didn't submit it in time. It doesn't count. And it's like, oh, uh, Bengals. <laughs> Bungles. No, yeah, that's funny. It, yeah. I wonder if there's a prop Wait. bet in Vegas for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, like, Lions fans have to be just super nervous. He was like, it'd be totally Lions for them to, to have their player just slip to them and they're so excited. And then all of a sudden, you see their screen just freeze. And they're like, oh, well. <laughs> They just auto drafted some guy who's thirty seven years old. <laughs> Why did you set your draft queue? <laughs> like every, every fantasy yeah. player has gone through this on a draft, and now it's yes, funny to see yes. that, that the GM's got to do it. That's funny. Uh, I uh, I saw a meme today where or, or a thought, like I think it was on Reddit. Um, wouldn't this be the year that? the Vikings would win the Super Bowl when absolutely nobody can go to the stadium to enjoy it. <laughs> kind of a Vikings thing to do. I'd still take it, man. I'd still take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that would be interesting, just the whole lack of fans. And that's kind of what they're talking about with yeah. baseball and some of these other sports, too. Yeah. Like, hey, we could start the season, right. but just no one can go watch, right. which right. Yeah, it's good to be able to watch them at home. But it'd be kind of weird to see home runs fly into just a whole bunch of empty seats and no one excited yeah. about it. It's like, would you even launch the fireworks? It's like, no, why bother? <laughs> why bother? People congregate. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Some MLB teams are used to that, but uh, yeah, not <laughs> right. the Twins. Um, so I've heard a couple different theories about Major League Baseball. What they might be able to do. One is kind of just realignment, one year realignment, maybe half the season, a hundred games or something. And it's Cactus League and Grapefruit League, which is the uh, spring training leagues, and yep. just have those be the leagues. And they play the games at their, um, you know, spring training facilities, and and away we go. Uh, that was one theory. The other one was just to have some neutral sites throughout the country that people could still maybe go to, limited ticket available availability type of a thing. Um, you know, obviously it depends on you know where we're at in a month or two, but. What do you right. think of those? And have you heard anything else? Yeah, those are the ones that I've kind of heard about is the Arizona and Florida plan and then the neutral site plans. Like anything to get mm-hmm. the baseball being played, I think would be helpful mm-hmm. just for overall wellness of the country to just be able to see like, hey, yeah. here's, here's something that's entertaining to watch. And obviously you've got to keep player health and staff health top of mind. You can't just be sending them out there saying, oh, you might get sick, but you have to do it to entertain the other people who are demanding the product. Right. So you can't just do that to, to everyone. But the Arizona, Florida plan is kind of interesting because that would open up being able to play in November and December. You wouldn't have to worry about, That's true. oh, here the Twins made the World Series, but it's December 2nd and you can either shovel off the field and play when it's eight degrees out or go play somewhere else. So you would be able to at least play longer into the year. And maybe that's part of the thinking that we can do the world series in December down in Arizona. Now, I don't know how excited the players would be to play August games in Arizona. I mean, maybe you do the first (laughs) half of the season in a Northern part of the country. That's Mm. kind of a common spot for congregation or else maybe you get to the point where you could play at target field and some of the other fields in the northern half and then by the time november december rolls around okay you have to play down the spring training site because you just physically can't play in snow yeah. and cold well i sure hope they come up with something that's an interesting idea maybe they can even get in most of the season 162 games i think that'd be a goal they would have they would you know records and all that kind of stuff and um and just the comp- competitiveness of a 162 game season um it may or may not have that long. I just hope it does. But here's the thing. I think people will be really disappointed if there isn't a baseball season, like really disappointed. I think the country will spontaneously combust if they don't have an NFL season. 
Yeah. I mean, this country is just built around football. Oh, yeah. Everyone just loves being all tuned up for that game, the one game a week, and you get all the hype from the week. You get the fantasy transactions. Like, yeah, around Wednesday, you stop thinking about the previous week. You start thinking about <laughs> the next week. And, and, and yeah, right. if, you, if you're not able to have those professional games and you just wonder what the vibe would be like if you are playing some of those games in a completely empty stadium. I mean, you made the joke uh, about right. some of these baseball teams are used to hitting home runs into empty bleachers, but no football right. team is used to playing no. in front of even like a 50% stadium. They're packed. Yeah. Yeah. It's so popular. It would be so missed. And yeah, it probably is going to be a socially distancing type of situation. Like you're going to have, you know, a row, if it has 30 seats, you're going to have four people in that row and then staggered throughout. So you're going to probably have quarter capacity if at best, I would imagine. And uh, right. it will be different. I remember, so the last, so I uh, don't know, I do play by, Danny does play by, are you still doing play by play, by the way? Yeah, I, I do a while? couple now and then. Yep. It's been yeah. a little while, so but that's, I'll fill in every now and then. Awesome. And Dan is uh, definitely part of our network. We just haven't been able to fill him, put him in a spot yet, but you're, he'll get his chance here pretty soon. Anyway, so the last game that I did play by play for was Lux uh, semifinals. Uh, no, yeah, sectional semifinal up in Hayward. And that was the day, I think it was the day after like the NBA canceled their season and all that stuff was coming down so fast. We were still able to get that game in with Luck in Northwood and uh, Luck won. Um, but it, but we had, I think that was, was it 88 people per school, per team could attend. And of those 88, I think it was, I think, well, it doesn't matter. It, um, I think that included the players and coaches and bus driver okay. and everything. So it was pretty limited. And Hayward has this gigantic for up here, really, really big gymnasium. And it was just so surreal to see the lack of people for such a big game. But sure. I will also say it was way louder than I thought it would be uh, from those fans. And I don't know if they were just like, you know, we got to make up for the lack of fans here, if they were just excited to be there or what, but they did a good job. Both sides like brought the maximum, of course, and uh, it was it got pretty loud in there. So hopefully, you know, that can be the same and provide that ambiance that just those, you know, those thrilling, those waves of cheers and those kinds mm -hmm. of things that are important. So, yeah, uh, that, hopefully that adds, comes. I mean, that adds so much to just even the watching of the game, getting the crowd noise in. And, and yeah, yeah, you just know, like as a fan, if if things are starting to get loud, it's like, oh, I better look up at the TV. It's going to get kind of exciting here. And you you always yeah. talk back to the the old Randy Moss days, like the crowd huh. just buzz would start to build and you'd kind of look at the TV and see the ball hanging in the air. And, <laughs> and we'd both, we'd be watching the same game and I'd be like, oh no. And you're like, touchdown, right. this is automatic. And of course yeah. it was because yeah. Randy Moss is yeah. one of the best receivers ever. <laughs> oh. I've been watching his highlights lately. It, it was amazing. I remember he was drafted, uh, I think it was our junior year of college, and uh, we went to separate colleges. But uh, I remember they drafted him. He had fallen, fallen, fallen. Denny Green gets up there like a minute into the clock, like, we're taking him. I, and I lapped. I was like, who's going to beat us? Who's going to be this? I ran out of my house and around that, like I was a college, dumb college kid, but um, not to say all college kids are dumb. I was a dumb college kid. So I was just like screaming around my neighborhood. So excited. Cause I knew what that meant. And that, that's probably my favorite draft memory. Speaking of the draft. So I don't know if anybody is going to, could get me to do that today. Or if I was a dumb college kid, I don't know if that anybody's that excited. I mean, there's some good players. Don't get me wrong, but. Uh, I guess if Tua fell to 22 or something, that would be <laughs> right. exciting, but <laughs> that's not happening. So anyway, yeah, thanks for bringing up the Randy Moss memory. I appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I can throw you a bone every now and then, then I'll just nod my head <laughs> down and show that Packers hat. And... <laughs> I was going to put on my – I don't have a Vikings hat. I was going to put on my gopher hat today, so 
but uh, didn't do that. So I'm kind of torn allegiances. I am a lifetime Gopher fan, and I love how they did this year. Love it, and I love that they're like ranked sixth in the. Uh, um, oh my gosh, thinking is hard. The recruiting, uh, recruiting, yeah, recruiting. They're sixth in the nation according to somebody, uh, and they're right behind. They're third in the Big Ten. Ohio State's first. Scotty's fifth, and Minnesota's sixth. Like that. That we're usually in a good year. We're sixth in the Big Ten. Like sixth in the nation. I love the direction that the Gophers are going, but I also love the and this is so strange to even think about but i maybe i shouldn't say love but i'm i'm really into the badgers too because we've got two hometown guys playing mm-hmm. for the badgers the chanel brothers uh we've got a guy from st croix falls playing for the gophers we've got a guy from that went to unity playing for um playing for iowa so my, my wife happy she's a hawkeye fan uh it's fun to see these guys starting to get more and more playing time like cody is down at in uh, Iowa, he's got a real chance of making an impact and maybe even starting this year as a junior, or actually a uh, redshirt sophomore, I think. You know, John is right there at, in in Wisconsin to be a starting fullback or at least split time with Stocky. Leo Chanel, he's being looked at, like, to replace, uh, uh, I can only think of his Twitter name, Chris Orr. So oh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's exciting, really, really fun. So are you a, you're a Badger fan, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's been great <laughs> seeing the Chanel boys like getting some time on air. And then you just see those little graphics when they say Grantsburg, yes. Wisconsin on there. It just brings yeah. a smile to my face just to say, oh, there's yeah. Grantsburg. And especially when the broadcasters may say little town of Grantsburg, Wisconsin. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Hey, and we're Grantsburg's on the map now. Baby. Bigger than, and it's funny when I think of that, oh, Grantsburg's way bigger than towns like Tony and some of the other ones in our area. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun when they, when they put those little, whatever they're called up on the screen and do yep. little highlights or stories on the boys. So that's fun. It's fun for everybody, I think. Um, so hopefully they have a college season. I know uh, UW shut down till what end of June, I think. The whole campus okay. is uh, done. So spring ball is obviously not happening, and we'll see. I mean, it's the same all over. So I don't think there's any advantage or disadvantage. But uh, I sure hope college ball gets going too it's safely, of course. But it's gotta, yeah. it's gotta get going. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think what what people are doing by social distancing and staying inside, I mean that that only helps because we're yeah. buying time for people to develop better strategies on how to combat the virus and come up with treatments for it as well. So, I know it's it's kind of maddening that to stay inside all the time, and it's it's weird to think yeah. that oh, I, this is the best thing I can do to contribute to the fight against it is to stay inside and do nothing, but. Yeah, that's that's the world we're in right now. That's the world we're in, and you know, it, it, there's lots of debate out there about how to open up and when to, and civil liberty. Like, there's a lot of noise, mm-hmm. but it just ultimately comes down to like let this. I I'm torn on it, to be honest with you. Like, I I, I feel both sides like genuinely, and uh, it's tough to even to know what's right. But that is why you and I have spent the last four episodes talking about geocaching because that's something that we can all do. We can all participate in as of right now. The trails are open up here and uh, you can go out with your family and uh, and practice social distancing and have some fun. Get that vitamin D that's going to help uh, get, get outside, get that fresh air and not the skunky inside air that you've been breathing for the last month. And uh, that's that's one of the big reasons that we decided to start this Bob and Dan show off with geocaching. So hopefully we can contribute a little bit to uh, bringing good things. So Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's good that the leaders have been pretty consistent in saying that exercise is good. Getting outside is good. And it's been very... Mm-hmm good for us to have something like geocaching too, to go and do outside and have a few different spots to go to. And of course, you're, you're smart when you're out there, you're not going in a group of 20. And you're not getting right next to other people who might be geocaching. I mean, you're on a, you're in an outdoor setting, there's plenty of room to be 
at least six feet apart from each other. So, so yeah, it, it's a perfect activity for the age that we're in right now. Yep. Yep. And I'm glad so many people are enjoying it. Let's put a button, put a ribbon on this one. I think we'll put a ribbon on it. <laughs> Don't do forget it. to go to geocaching.com and like uh, friend request Danny. He's Geosports or no. Uh, yeah. Geosports. Yep, and I am BRKZC. We'll put all that stuff up in the description so you don't have to remember. Make sure you download the uh, geocaching cheat sheet. It's uh, helpful stuff, a checklist of what to bring, some acronyms you'll want to know, some other geocaching stuff, including uh, our geocaching name so you can remember to friend us on there. And, uh, yeah, good luck to the Vikings tonight in the draft. I hope uh, the Internet goes down in Green Bay tonight. And, uh, <laughs> think that's going to do it for us. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it'll be just like, was it 2005 when Aaron Rodgers kept falling and falling? Maybe Tua will just go all the way down to like 29th or whenever the Packers pick. Or, he ain't getting by the Vikings, I promise that. start that controversy <laughs> all over again like we had back oh at the gosh. end of the 2000s. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. you guys do not get another franchise quarterback. That just needs to be a rule. That's just unfair. Gosh, it's so stupid. What, All right, what, now you've got we, me. We angry. can't go for we can't go for sixty years of Hall of Fame quarterbacking in a row. Yeah, settle for forty. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, you had forty in a row plus, and there was a little time there in the eighties, but you had flipping Bart Starr too. This is not fair. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we'll save this for another discussion. All right. All right. All right. We'll get back at it later. Next time, yep. uh, we will have the entire draft, right? That's a Thursday. Yeah, we'll be on the air yep. again uh, early next week, and we'll have the draft behind us. We'll we'll, we'll get Danny's uh, draft grades, um, channel his inner Mel Kuyper. All right. I've been tapped. All right. Sounds we'll good, Dan. Okay. All right. So All right. for Dan Hacks, my name is Bob Rombach. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Bob and Dan Show. Have a great day.